thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, I'm just going to ask folks to keep their mics muted until we actually get to the Q and A um, period. Although um, we might, we maybe still are not unmuting people during Q and A. I think we might just be taking questions through the chat. Um, so I think that's how we're running at this time. Um, so thanks so much um, for being here again. The webinar is being recorded. Um, and will be available to view and also share with your friends later if you want we're going to put it up on our youtube channel and also up on our website um and the first thing i'd like to do is acknowledge that we as hopes harvest are operating on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of the narragansett nipmuc niantic wampanoag and manistean indigenous peoples um, this is a great mapping tool. If folks don't know about it, I highly recommend going to see. Um, you can see all different parts of the world and um, which um, peoples were um, originally there. So um, this land has been stolen. It was cared for and called home by many more indigenous tribes from time immemorial, and those are now since gone. Native peoples then and now cultivated the land and animals in symbiosis, living in partnership with the natural world in sustainable ways that we could learn a lot from as we suffer from the effects of an industrialized global food system. Now more than ever, indigenous communities are suffering from the effects of food insecurity, a byproduct of an industrialized food system and colonialist state, which has limited access to traditional resources and knowledge that have been cultivated for thousands of years. Increased access to quality food, self-determination, and food sovereignty for these communities has never been more important, and Hope's Harvest is committed to showing up in partnership with Indigenous leaders who are taking a stand today, as they always have, for the earth and their traditional relationship with the land and the abundance that it provides. So this is our agenda for the day, or for the event. Um, we're going to ask folks to do introductions in the chat. Just let us know your name. Um, if you haven't already, you can rename yourself with your um, preferred pronouns and include that in your introduction as well. Um, you can tell us what your favorite thing to glean is. You can tell us um, what cocktail you're drinking this evening, if you brought something for happy hour. Um, and yeah, we're super excited um, that folks are here. Um, so let's get those introductions going. My name is Ava. I'm the founder and director of Hope's Harvest Rhode Island. Um, we also have Merle, um, who is our magical AmeriCorps um, service member who has been doing such incredible work for us all season and um, organized this event. So thank you, Merle, for being here. We're so grateful to have them. Um, and uh, we have an additional staff person with us. Molly Rose is um, here as an attendee. Um, she's our operations manager. Um, and then we're gonna introduce Kohei and Keeley um, in just a few minutes, but they are also joining us and we're super, super grateful to have them as well. Um, we're gonna talk just for a couple minutes about Hope's Harvest and farmers and what we do with farmers, how we partner with farmers. Um, and then I'm gonna introduce Keeley and Kohei. They're gonna give kind of an overview of who they are, how they came to farming and movement ground um, as a farm and what it does in the community and their incredible work. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A, time for Q&A at the end um, so we can all get a chance to ask questions and, um, and yeah, do that. So um, if anybody does have questions throughout, by all means, continue to put them in the chat. Merle's going to be um, keeping an eye on that. So that'll be a great way. If you have thoughts that kind of pop up, um, please put them in there and we'll, we'll go back and review them and we'll be able to ask those questions at the end. So Hope's Harvest and Farmers. Um, so I'm assuming most of you know what Hope's Harvest does because you're here, but if you don't, if you got here in another way, um, we are an organization that fundamentally our core work is we mobilize volunteers to go out to farms and harvest food that would otherwise go to waste and we distribute it to hunger relief agencies across the state of Rhode Island. So we have three main stakeholders as we think of it in that group. We have volunteers who come to the fields, we have agencies who receive the food, and then obviously we couldn't do any of what we do without the farmers who are growing the food. Um, so we're partnering with those farms to bring fresh food to people in need. And we see ourselves as providing a service. We're here to make it easy for farmers to donate or provide food um, that perhaps because they're running small businesses 
working incredibly hard. They don't always have the time to do that. And we want to simplify that process and bring some skill and professionalism to that operation as much as we possibly can, because we ultimately know that farmers love to feed people and they're deeply committed to making sure that their communities are nourished and we can make that possible. Um, we've worked with about 30 farms since 2018, all over um, Rhode Island and actually southeastern Massachusetts as well. Um, and we don't just help farmers donate food. We also contract with farms to grow food specifically for hunger relief agencies. And then we also partner with farms to um, purchase their surplus for the purposes of hunger relief. So those are two things that are kind of outside the pure model of just going out and harvesting food that we also think are really important. Um, we paid out about $65,000 to farmers in 2020. Um, a lot of that was emergency funds that came through because of COVID. Um, that was not what we were expecting. It was a lot more than we were expecting. And we're on track this year to pay out about $100,000 to farms um, across the state. And we're thrilled about that because for those of you who don't know, <laughs> or just it, it, it is important to reiterate that farmers are an absolutely essential part of our ecosystem. Um, we all eat food, we all need to eat food, and making sure that we know where our food comes from is about resilience. It's about understanding how we nurture each other as a community and how we're able to show up for each other. And um, we could operate on a sort of purely charity donation-based model, but we think that it's important to be aware holistically of the entire system and know that if farmers can't maintain themselves, they can't make enough money to survive, we're not gonna be able to recover surplus for donation. Farms need to be able to make a living, farmers need to be able to make a living, and we wanna be part of um, making sure that that's a possibility and help farmers see also the hunger relief um, universe as a potential market for their product in a way that not all farmers necessarily do. So um, if you're interested in learning more about the farms that we've worked with, I'm super excited. We just got a new feature up on our website. It's um, Meet the Farmers. So we've got farmer profiles up there of all the different farms that we've worked with. And it's really nice because you can find out information about how you can go support those farmers. So do they have a farm stand? Do they have a CSA? Um, and we think one of the services we provide to farms is letting people know that they're out there and that they're community minded and that they want to um, make sure that everybody in their communities have a, has enough to eat. So when you're making a decision about where you're going to go at the farmer's market or where you're going to go um, when you're signing up for a CSA, that maybe you'll take a look at our site and see those farms who are really taking a stand for um, our community's food security and choose to support them first. So. Um, that's enough of me. Um, oh, look, it's Kohei. Hi, Kohei. Um, so we are so thrilled to have these two wonderful farmers here with us today. Kohei Ishihara is the founder and director of Movement Ground Farm. He is a native of Maryland. He first moved to Rhode Island to attend Brown University. And upon graduating, he co-founded the Providence Youth Student Movement, PRISM, which I did not know and is so cool, um, as I love that organization. Um, it's a youth development and community organizing agency which works to empower and educate Southeast Asian youth. After 10 years leading PRISM and a brief time living in California, Kohei started taking classes and learning everything he could about farming. In 2013, he moved back to Massachusetts and began working with Cooks Valley Farm in Rentham and Freedom Food Farm in Raynham, who we've also um, received donated food from and also purchased surplus from. Um, soon thereafter, he founded Movement Ground Farm on a property in Berkeley, Mass, after graduating from New Entries Farm Business Planning course, which I used to be a teacher of when I was a graduate cool. student at Tufts, which is so cool. Okay, small world, love it. Um, and then Keely, uh, who is the farm manager at Movement Ground Farm, is a queer netbook farmer, youth worker, and community organizer who grew up in Cambridge and lived most of her adult life in Boston. Keely has committed the last 13 seasons to growing and cultivating vegetables, flowers, herbs, and medicine in spaces of all sizes, from her small second floor back porch to a 31 acre farm operation and many farms in between. When not tending to plants and land, Keely can be found organizing as a part of the leadership team of Rooted in Community, a national network of youth, food, and environmental justice organizations, and with the Board of Trustees for the Northeastern Farmers of Color Land Trust. Keely is also a member of Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective, an intertribal collective of women and two-spirit people who are working with their communities to restore traditional lifeways, foodways, and uplift rematriation. 
so excited uh, to have both of you here um, and so excited to hear about your journeys. Um, and yeah, I'll let you two take it away. Okay, hey, great. Um, yeah, so I, uh, Keely and I thought that I would go first and because um, we kind of do it chronologically. So I'm going to introduce, yeah, talk about how I got into farming and what led us to Tiverton. And then Keely's going to talk about what led her to Tiverton. And then we'll talk about what's happening here at Tiverton. <laughs> There's a lot. So um yeah my <laughs> my journey started i guess you know i used to trace like the like the core motivations of what i do um to just my experience growing up as a person of color in a predominantly white community but also even just as importantly as a queer person of color growing up in the suburbs of Maryland and of the isolation, um, ostracism, repression, um, disgust I faced, you know, growing up in um, kind of a conservative environment um, just gave me the basis for, um, gave, gave me a basis of a, a solidarity framework to um view the world through a social justice lens and always try and you know get kind of i you know made a life commitment to always try always try to um align myself with those who are struggling and those who are the most oppressed um and that led me into the field of youth and community organizing so during college, um, this really amazing movement was born um, on the south side and west end of Providence in, around in 2002, when the Cambodian and US government signed a repatriation agreement. Um, so all of a sudden, thousands of Cambodians across the United States, but especially, you know, a pretty large mass, a, a pretty large crew in Providence were all of a sudden getting deported back to a country they escaped a genocide from. So that launched, um, yeah, a huge youth and student movement in Providence that I, I felt honored to be part of. And that pretty much took the next 10 years of my life um, building the organization. Um, so I kind of, you know, after 10 years, kind of went through burnout and in my burnout and in my own, um, journey to rebuild my health, I turned to a small garden plot, which turned to a large garden plot, which turned to an orchard, which turned to like working at farms, reading about farming, taking classes at community colleges, online, um, classes and, um, yeah, after working at farms for two years, um, I took the class, um, the new entry business class, where we had to really like map out um, a whole budget for a year, a whole crop plan. Um, yeah, a whole succession plan, too. So once I did that, I kind of discovered that um, while farming is like, I saw that farming was slightly possible, but still next to impossible in terms of the numbers. But it gave me the silver lining of hope. And I just, it kind of catapulted me forward because I just saw like, wow, we can actually do this. Um, and I was also just really inspired by a lot of the farms I worked at and farms I volunteered at. Um, just seeing just the level of like autonomy that farmers had in, you know, making their own income from the land, producing their own food from the land, like literally, like literally like paying rent, paying payroll, um, buying equipment through, you know, selling tomatoes. That was like um, really, yeah, it just hit me really hard that, um, 
that these farmers could achieve so much, but every single step of the way they had to like earn, like there was no, there were no shortcuts like there were in my other, in other parts of my life. Um, you know, there's always shortcuts in the professional world. Like you can cut and paste stuff. You can submit a grant that takes three hours and get $10,000. Um, in the farming world, there were like no shortcuts. You almost had to earn everything you made. And so it kind of, the level of like raw accountability um, was really exciting to me. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about just quickly, um, I'm gonna show a few pictures. Share my screen. Am I sharing my screen? No. So yeah, this is a picture of a, some of my best friends and we're starting our first rounds of seeds in this tiny apartment, um, several stories apartment. So uh, those seeds were started um, and then, you know, eventually carried down flights of stairs and put into a truck and brought to a farm. Um, uh, I also um, asked a friend I could use if I could use their land and uh, started a bunch of shiitake mushroom logs. The first year, you know, so I, I, I kind of picked some of these pictures to kind of show kind of the raw excitement of like, you know, the first year of starting a farm um, where there was a lot of like enthusiasm, hunt, you know, lots of volunteers, lots of friends, lots of community coming out to kind of give a hand. Experiencing um, hatching ducklings. Uh, a friend that fell out of a tree and uh, became part of the farm for a while. He was named Bandit. And then I went a little overboard. Oh, <laughs> I went a little overboard and also overbird. Um, so these three chicks um, became that chick. Uh, they were emus. Um, the idea was um, to really kind of get in on an egg business doing chicken eggs, duck eggs, quail eggs, and emu eggs. Um, but it was a lot of trials and tribulations, so that was definitely a mistake because there were times when uh, this bird escaped and um, I had to find the bird, you know, in the town of Berkeley at an elementary school and drag it back. Uh, yeah, so the first year of farming, um, yeah, we were in Berkeley, Massachusetts, and we had about 30, 35 CSA members. Um, by our second year of farming, we were up to 80 CSA members and started to develop this model of distributing food through social, uh, different social justice organizations and networks. Um, not only was it a model for food distribution, but it was also a model for engaging communities of color and not just communities of color, but communities of color that were rooted in um, community organizing and connecting them to um, the farm and to land and to food. Yeah, so this is a picture of the front of the Berkeley Street um, behind that was our first uh, van and behind that was a high tunnel we built to the left of the van is the mobile chicken coop that we started building. Oops. So, um, so we did, yeah, so we we ran, I ran this at Berkeley as a sole proprietor enterprise um, for three seasons and pretty much barely broke even each season. Well, the first season um, definitely lost a lot of money. The second and third seasons, um, I more broke even, but, but end up, you know, but if you account for like the equipment I invested in, um, you know, spent more money than we brought in. 
But overall, those three years really showed me that, um, yeah, I, I have a lot to learn about farming. Um, the finances will be tight, but the this type of vision is really felt by the community. So organizations were really interested in using the farm as a place to retreat, um, a place where youth could, um, where we, you know, organizations could do programming with young people. Um, and so because of like kind of that excitement and we kind of did a feasibility study of like, you know, okay, you know, what would this take to take this to a next level and, you know, kind of get the stability of owning land and having an organization to run it. So we formed a committee, we did a feasibility study. Um, I brought in family and we decided that, you know, that there was a way in which we could, um, and a model in which we could buy land and yeah, build an organization. So uh, yeah, we searched the next year, 2018, we searched um, all over the Northeast, um, New Hampshire, um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and we finally settled on this incredible, beautiful, beautiful spot in Tiverton, Rhode Island. Um, and yeah, so I guess I'll let uh, Keely jump in here and talk about where she came, from, um, you know, where she came from and how she got to um, Movement Ground Farm in Tiverton, and then we'll talk about yeah what we've done right now to. Um, buy this land, structure our organization, our mission, and what, we, what we've got going on right now. Awesome. Yeah, feel free to leave that picture up. It's nice. <laughs> I mean, it's a map, but hello, everyone. I'm Keely. Um, nice to see familiar names and faces. Um, so let's see um, my journey to end up in this image that y'all are looking at. <laughs> um, so I... Um, I, my journey starts um, right out of eighth grade, a um, long time ago. Uh, I, yeah, I grew up, um, my parents were separated and I grew up sort of in city and suburbs of um, Boston. I, I went to the Cambridge Public Schools um, and yeah, always sort of had access to like suburbs because one parent was outside of the city and one was in the city. And so that was always a part of my life being in and out of the city, experiencing, um, land uh in in both senses so like both in urban context as well as suburban and rural context um that's important because um when i was in eighth grade i really wanted a summer job and when you're 14 years old it is really hard to find a job uh that will hire you because you're really young um and there's a lot of legal restrictions around employment um and there was this organization um in greater boston called the food project and at one point in my childhood, um, I had lived near one of the farms and always um, when I was little would be like, why are there kids out there in that field? I'd ask my parents, they'd be like, oh, I don't know. We'll look into it. And they looked it up and um, it was just something we knew existed, but uh, you know, it was just like this weird farm that employed kids. Uh, then I, you know, flash forward to when I'm 14 years old, we're like, oh, remember that organization that hires teenagers um, to work on farms? Like, let's go Google that and see what's up, what's happening over there. Um, and that was how I refound that organization, the Food Project. Um, they did hire, in fact, hire 14 year olds. Um, and so I applied. Um, oh, wow. Somebody else worked for the, <laughs> the Food Project. That's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, so I applied, I got the job. And um, again, like I was just looking for a summer job. I had not farmed. I had um, been in gardens a little bit, but really did not think I necessarily had a green thumb. Um, I was sort of seeking community and ways to be engaged, uh, I don't know, in meaningful work, but I didn't really know what that meant. I was 14. Um, and that summer really changed my life. Um, I got to work with a lot of awesome teenagers from uh, surrounding school districts um, and met a bunch of awesome adults who treated me like I was a real person, which wasn't how I was getting, um, that's not how it felt like in school most of the time. I was like, 
you know, I, school was not my thing. Um, and I had this outlet that was awesome. And um, I was teaching, I was like learning all these new skills and um, being taught about all the ways that various social justice um, issues intersected with uh, land and food and farming. Um, and after that first summer, I was pretty hooked. Um, and basically the food project had tiered uh, programs. And so you could like continue to apply to sort of higher level positions and um, gain more responsibility and more experience. Um, and so throughout my entire high school experience um, in summers, I was working full-time farming and in the school year, I would work on Saturdays and sometimes after school. Um, I got to experience sort of like the farming for a CSA model, farming for um, markets, farming for restaurants, um, donating lots and lots of food and working like we would have the opportunity to go and work in some of the hunger relief organizations that we were donating food to. Um, so it was like a pretty rounded experience um, wherein I got, yeah, just like loads of different, access to lots of different skills, um, greenhouse production, um, high tunnels, um, just like so, so many, so many different things. The food project over various periods of time has had about seven different farms and each one is a little bit different. And so you, um, in experiencing each of those farms, you get to learn different systems and see different ways that, um, you know, various managers uh, take care of the land and, and the processes and ways that they decide to trellis their tomatoes or, you know, all of those things. Um, and as a teenager who was, I was into the social aspect of school. I was friends with people. I liked my teachers, but I did not pull grades. And I was always disappointed um, in the way that I was being taught um, and the way that yeah, just like the way that school was, <laughs> I won't go into that, but um, it was an amazing outlet to have a place where I was valued and learning um, and I could build intimate relationship with land and, and food and plants um, and really, you know, like dug into cooking and, and um, just bringing all of that food into my own household and sharing that with my family. Um, and that was super awesome and meaningful. Um, and so after I graduated high school, I definitely was not, I, you know, I was like, oh, I'm, I do this thing, I'm a farmer, but like, that's not, I don't know if that's like a real job that I can have forever. Um, I, I knew that there was adults who did that. Um, I didn't fully understand how they, how that happened. Um, I knew some adults who had like gone to ag school or, you know, I knew, I knew it was possible, but I, I wasn't fully invested in that being, um, what I did, I just was like, this is just, I don't know, it's a, it's a thing I do. Um, but I, I don't know if that's my like, my calling. Um, and briefly did uh, an AmeriCorps program called City Year. Um, education and like youth development work, um, having been a young person who had a lot of adults invest that were not like family members, um, invest heavily in me and, and support me and um, teach me so many amazing, valuable things. Um, having that experience made me pretty passionate about working with young people and, and giving back and sort of paying it forward. Um, and in a lot of ways with my tribal community, I had sort of played that role um, in mentorship with younger kids. And um, I just, I really valued the education piece. And um, I briefly, so I did city year and then that summer right after city year, farmed again, um, seasonal positions. Um, and then was like, I should try college, right? That's like a thing people do. Let me let me try college for a minute. Um, was not convinced um, for so many reasons. Um, I was starting to realize that all of the work that I did care about and enjoyed and loved was um, not something that I was gonna gain and learn in a classroom. Um, and I definitely was never gonna be able to pay off the debt that college was gonna cause by farming um, if that was what I truly did wanna do. And so I dropped out of college after like a semester and a half um, and got a full time, got like convinced um, a manager at the food project that I totally wanted to come back and farm and um, basically got like plugged back into the seasonal farm, farm worker circuit. So like the March to November-ish uh, job schedule and got pulled into running youth programs at the food project at the same time as being a full-time farmer. Um, and then, sort of just realized that like, yeah, that you can make a life out of this. Um, 
and started like taking myself, I guess, more seriously in my own learning. And this was, you know, mind you, I was like 19 years old um, and was realizing, yeah, like this is, this is the work that I'm called to do. And this is the work that um, I find the most meaning in my life. And there's ways to um, do, you know, you, you don't have to just be a farmer. You can teach and farm. You can um, be engaged in more than, than just field labor. Um, and that's, I mean, that's what's important to me is bringing people to the land and making sure folks have connection to their food. Um, that food isn't just going to the person who can pay the highest price. Um, that was, I mean, in big part, that's impacted by what, when I was being brought up in the food project, we were constantly talking about the intersectional um, issues that, that, you know, uh, come in touch with land and food justice. Um, and so I was just, that was the lens I understood farming through. Um, and so, yeah, I spent the next four or five years um, working in various positions on both food project farms and non uh, food project farms, um, being an assistant grower, assistant manager, uh, running markets, finally got myself onto a tractor, started learning about how to do different um, tractor work and tractor cultivation and the ways that some systems need or don't need that. Um, and yeah, I just basically like rolled up my sleeves and tried to learn absolutely everything that I possibly could so that I wouldn't have to go to college. <laughs> um, I would say that was a big motivator. I definitely had family members who, um, I think still, you know, just like anyone worried that um, with the low wages that farmers are, you know, make for pretty much ever and all the financial hardships that Kohei was referring to, um, that I'd run myself into a hole at some point. Um, and so I am continuing um, to try and work my way and weasel my way um, into making this a life path that is sustainable and is possible, um, knowing the realities that capitalism has put us in um, as a society. So um, yeah, so that equated to a handful of, yeah, like five or six years of um, bouncing between farms and learning different folk systems and gaining some amazing mentors who taught me all kinds of um, awesome stuff. And, and also um, at the same time, like still getting to work with young people as much as possible on land. And um, teaching has always been a big part of farming for me, um, passing on knowledge, um, whether that be formally, like through running youth programs on the farms I've worked on or um, informally just passing that knowledge on to um, people I'm in community with, um, folks from my tribe, um, and engaging in, in any and all land work, um, whenever possible. Um, and let's see. So before we're, I'm almost to Tiverton in this story. Um, I, so in my, like wanting to farm really and, and invest in that and have, um, that be like what my full-time job is. Many of the positions that aren't manager positions on farms are, um, are seasonal. They're like March to November ish thereabouts. Um, and in order to get, uh, to have full-time employment or to have like that financial security, um, you would need to be a farm manager. And I wasn't sure, all the farm managers I knew, like it was like a torturous job. You have to deal with like, I mean, all the people, all the logistics, all of the planning, all of the ordering, and you have to show up for the work every day and like seem like you're having a good time, right? It seems pretty, <laughs> Kohi knows. Um, and I, I wasn't sure that that was something I wanted to do. So I, um, I actually, right before this position, um, I was technically in a youth uh, supervisor position on the Food Projects Farms for two years. Um, so I was farming, but all, like in a working solely with the, the young people who are staff members. Um, and that was great and all. I like absolutely adored the young people I worked with and I adored um, teaching them farming and um, being on the farms in that way. But I totally missed all of the planning and like logistical uh, problem solving pieces of farming. Um, and I, I, I took that position and I applied for that position mostly because of the financial security of having, you know, full-time year round employment, um, knowing that eventually hopefully a job would come up that better aligned to the broad, like the big picture of what I wanted, which was, to have a land-based job um, that was full-time year round. And so then let's see, I, on a whim, not on a whim, I planned for a really long time to leave that position um, in late fall of, what was that, 2019? And, um, 
and then take the winter off, do a bunch of conferences, learn a bunch of shit, pardon my language, learn a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I, I curse all day, Kohei knows, sorry. <laughs> um, learn tons of stuff um, and, and get myself studied up so that um, any sort of year round position, being that an assistant manager or manager position that came up on a farm, um, that I would feel ready to jump back in to um, the planning side and the, the thinking side of um, farm operation as well. And yeah, uh, Kohei was hiring for a manager that winter. Um, and I had about five or six different friends email me that job description. <laughs> I'd seen it on my own. <laughs> um, I got texts sending it to me. Everyone was just like, like arrow, it was just like arrows, like go there, go there, do that. Um, like every everyone and I was like okay I get it I get it <laughs> I'll apply I'll apply I was already like planning to apply on my own but then that was just like the extra kick in the butt um telling me that was what I was supposed to do so and that was right before the pandemic <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah so um yeah we keep yeah so yeah I hope Keely know what <laughs> knew or had a had a sense of what she was getting into um because uh yeah i know things things are wonderful at moving ground but um i was kind of hiring keely at a place of rebirthing movement ground farm and restarting um we had just acquired the property in tiverton and you know it sucks to move apartments and more than moving apartments it sucks to move homes and worse than that, imagine moving a farm operation. It's a lot of work. But this was even bigger than that because it also involved uh, moving my 70-year-old parents from California to Rhode Island to be part of this project um, as a way for kind of me to be connected and take care of them. And it was also a way for them to kind of support this venture financially. Um, and also in order to like support me and to support my elderly parents, my sister's family, her wife and her daughter moved here from California and also live in Tiverton to be part of this farm operation. So, so it was a big deal moving a farm myself and two families to Tiverton, readjusting and then reinventing ourselves here. Um, it is so hard to start a farm. And even more than that, it is so expensive to buy land. Um, we didn't even think we would be able to afford land here. Um, but when we found, but what made it kind of possible is we found this small seven, eight, beautiful seven acre piece of land that's adjacent to farmland on three sides. So, you know, this worked for us because originally we were looking for like 100 acres, uh, but there would be no way we could afford 100 acres in Rhode Island. But this worked because we could afford seven acres potentially. And because it's adjacent to farmland on three sides, we could lease more land to farm on. Because, you know, kind of as, as ridiculously expensive as it is to um, buy farmland, it's almost ridiculously cheap to lease farmland. So we're talking about $100 per acre per year is kind of the going rate to lease farmland. If you're like, what? Um, so yeah, the idea is we could buy just a small seven acre plot, put all of our farm infrastructure on the land that we own and then lease more out to farm. And that's what we've done. And, that, and so, so we're already leasing another five acres from our neighbor here. Um, but it was still too expensive. So we formed, um, we got a lawyer and we formed an LLC. And my father, I, my two aunts and uncle, and then nine CSA members who supported the farm operation over the past three years, who are CSA members, pulled their money in together. And we were, we were able to pull in enough money to buy this property outright. Um, and this was part of the strategy too, to make it sustainable so that we wouldn't have to be stressed out every month uh, making a mortgage payment. 
Um, and in Tiverton, Rhode Island, the property taxes are high enough. That's already feels like a mortgage payment. So we were able to really put the pieces of the puzzle together um, with family, with community to make this a sustainable operation and buy this land. And of course, this isn't our land. Um, this land, uh, the land we're on is Poconocet land. Um, and, you know, we're just temporary uh, caretakers of this land. Um, just, yeah, just to definitely mention. But yeah, so we bought the land in 2019. Um, and I immediately wanted to continue farming, so did a small CSA. And the next year, we formed a board of directors. Um, we set up Movement Ground Farm as a nonprofit organization. And we hired Keeley uh, right before we, yeah, we hired Keeley as our farm manager. And yeah, when we are interviewing Keeley and through Keeley's first weeks, you know, we're definitely like, as you can see, um, Keeley brings a lot of energy, um, a lot of skill. Already brought, you know, even though she's really, even though she's um, much younger than me, brought 13 years of farming experience. Um, and an incredibly um, new and important perspective and community was then connected and added to Movement Ground. Um, Keeley really brings an indigenous perspective and uh, also brings her community um, and has brought her community to this farm and really added, added a lot to our vision. Um, so that was, so last year was Keeley and I's first year working together. Um, this year, we, um, oh, and over the winter, we started to get a little bit more official. So now we have our bylaws, we have personnel policies, uh, but we're still like relatively a new organization. And um, yeah, Keely, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, maybe our CSA or what we're growing and stuff like that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say, so yeah, last year with this whole movement towards having it be sort of a nonprofit organization and whatnot, um, being hit with the pandemic was an especially exciting um, curveball. Um, I won't dwell on it much, but let's, let's, it's easy to say that um, all the plans kind of went out the window as we had thought they would be. Um, and so, yeah, last year, while yeah, last year was definitely still incredibly successful in so many ways, um, it was definitely not without like just extraordinary challenges at every turn. Um, and whilst COVID is definitely still very much a reality at the forefront of all of our planning, um, it does feel like there is quite a bit more spaciousness this year to sort of, um, yeah, to, to, I don't know, we, we just know how to function with it better. Um, which uh, has allowed us, so we, last year we decided to up the CSA. Um, so Kohei had said his, his original numbers, remind me Kohei, how much did you have your first year? And then you were at 80 for a while. It was like, yeah. And then- Well, the, we, we, yeah, we've never been above 80. 80 is we the most you've months, had, yeah. right. So um, 80 is like sort of the most CSA members that Movement Ground had had. And with the pandemic, um, we weren't sure if market farmers markets would be a thing. So we just upped the CSA numbers in hopes that um, we would, you know, be able to get a customer base. Um, and it was wildly successful. I feel like we sold out pretty, pretty quickly and easily um, with pretty little effort um, at about 100, 115 shares. And this year we're upping that again to 130. Um, and we'll still do a farmer's market. And we're really excited to um, have a bunch of our food go to Hope's Harvest. Um, and also, you know, we do have events um, and we try and um, engage our members um, in programming on the farm and get them to come out to the farm as much as possible, um, as well as uh, movement partner organizations. And so um, there's also, you know, food always ends up going to those folks too. 
Um, I am pretty well known for sending people home with arms full of food um, if they visit or volunteer. Can't help it. Um, like I think you said, Ava, at the beginning, like farmers just want people to eat their food. And it's, it's definitely true for me. I'm always trying to get people to eat our food. Um, so this year, it just feels like, yeah, we're able to, um, yeah, better, better plan um, for a more active farm, a more activated farm um, that will sort of be living out the mission more. We have a really awesome staff hired um, that are awesome and thoughtful. And um, I think all feel pretty committed to just like thinking about the longevity of Movement Ground and um, are all invested in, in putting together systems, which is so much of what the work is right now uh, that are going to be sustainable and um, make all of our vision possible in the long term and not just um, have us all burn out really quickly. Or at least that's what we're all working really hard towards, and what we're prioritizing as we, as we get our, as we get our systems together. It looks so beautiful out there right now. I'm like, I wish I could, like, Koi, if you want to talk, I can walk people out to have a view. <laughs> Keely, I don't, I don't want to interrupt oh, yeah. either of you, That'd be cool. but. That'd be cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just want to let everyone know we have about 10 minutes left and um, we want to make sure okay. that people have a chance to ask questions. So if you want to start putting your questions in the chat now, you can do that. And then Kohei and Keely, I wonder if I could just ask you to talk a little bit more explicitly about some of the um, social mission programs that the farm does, because I know I'm super excited mm -hmm. to hear um, how you all articulate that. And I know that um, the... Yeah folks who are on the call would love to hear about that too. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, this is actually the first year that we're putting money into our programs. Keely's showing you now the high tunnel in the field. Um, yeah, so it's the first year we're actually doing programmings not on a whim and not on a side. So um, we're really excited about that. Um, so what we we're doing is we're doing some workshops and events that are open to CSA members and the general public, um, such as herbal medicine making, or um, we may be doing some uh, on-farm yoga, walking meditations, and you know all of these will be like spaces that are embracing and welcome to um, you know immigrants, people of color, refugees. Um, black folks, uh, indigenous folks. Um, but we're also hosting a lot of events and retreats that are for the organizations that we're in alliance with. Um, organizations that help us help us distribute our food this year um, or in previous years. Um, so it's really exciting, you know, right now we're already designing retreats and gatherings for the Province Youth Student Movement, um, the Alliance for the Mobilization of Our Resistance in Providence Amor, uh, Movement Education Outdoors, um, Arise, um, uh, Southeast Asians in Rhode Island, oh wait, wait, Alliance of Rhode Island Southeast Asians in Education, oh my God. Hopefully she doesn't kill me for mis messing that. Um, the Our Fire Collective, um, we're working with um, the collective Keeley's part of the Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective. So there's going to be a lot happening at this farm, um, but about 60% of it is kind of like pre-designated uh, for the groups that are kind of helping us distribute our food. Which and now you know Hope's Harvest is definitely our, a distributor, so we should talk about you know hosting an event for Hope's Harvest. So, yeah, that sounds great. And do you um, you have a special um, thing going on with your CSA too, right? Which we were going to talk a little bit about at the end. Um, but do you want to mention that as well? The um, the solidarity, solidarity. shares. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So during the CSA sign up process, CSA members have the option to donate more than what their CSA costs. And that usually funds almost, you know, maybe that funds about 60 to 70% of what it costs to give away free CSA shares to 30 families 
for the entire summer and the entire fall. So we, yeah, we did this last year and we're going to continue to do it this year. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I don't want to move along too quickly. If you have other stuff that you are like, oh, I didn't get to say it. that thing. Are you, how are you yeah. feeling? That's good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so I only see one question so far in the chat, but if anybody else has questions they want to ask, I have a couple um, that I've been thinking about as you've been talking. Um, I just started rereading. Um, it's it, like it's hard right now to find things that like are calming because everything's a little bit chaotic and stressful. And um, so I I picked up the One Straw Revolution uh, recently. Um, for like comfort reading before bed. It's a really amazing book um, about permaculture and in Japan and um, a sort of Taoist approach to farming. And I was curious now that you have your land that you're gonna be on for a long time, how are you thinking about um, permaculture and setting up sort of long-term infrastructure on the land that um, that is like oriented towards that type of thinking versus like row crop kind of stuff and, and and where are you at with that right now it's a long it's a long game and it's a lot of work um i feel that i'm pretty much embedded in right now like a lot of infrastructure goals so we just had to kind of buy a tiny bit more land from a neighbor in order to have enough space to build a barn. Um, so, the, you know, the work, um, the work of building a barn, um, yeah, I don't know if that really falls in the lens, too much in the lens of permaculture, but you know, we are gonna try to make it um, energy independent. And the barn's gonna be a physical manifestation for um, not just housing all of our farm equipment, but providing space for our programming and for retreats. And you know, having a kitchen and a bathroom so that the farm can function as a community center. Um, in terms of the land, um, well, Keeley's been um, really helping with uh, our practice of cover cropping to really start building and restoring the soil health. So previously, this was farmed conventionally, so a lot of the soils become degraded. And because it's degraded, like it's not holding moisture well. So last year when we had the historic drought, like a lot of our plants suffered. The plants that didn't have irrigation were just gone. So Keeley's doing an incredible job at being adamant about cover cropping and just starting this, you know, but a long-term process of like restoring soil health. And I'm personally trying to also really get into planting trees and that's a new ball game for me. So I have a lot I'm trying to do, a lot of self-education I'm trying to do. Yeah, they, they require a lot more uh, tending and attention than you. Yeah. You're like, oh, you just put the tree in the ground. It'll just grow. It'll just be a tree. But it's yeah. not that simple, um, especially when they're babies and you have like wildlife around and like deers that want to chomp on the little baby trees and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, because the landscape here was pretty much designed for farming and also for the beautiful open view. But because of that and because we're coastal, there's an incredible amount of wind. And Keely knows it's almost daily here. And you know, strong wind leads to soil erosion. Yeah. So we're trying to figure out a plan to repopulate the earth, you know, with um, trees. And a lot of the trees here are also suffering from um, are being strangled by bittersweet and other invasive weeds. So we're trying to like restore the health of our current trees, but also to um, plant a lot of more trees on the property. So. But I think we have a long way to go to like um, until we could get the farm, you know, uh, get the farm into a state of like permaculture where it's like functioning almost as it's one organism and, you know, and that we're on top of it. <laughs> Is 
some more questions. I don't, oh, are there currently any volunteer or work opportunities available? I'm totally new to the world of farming, but love houseplants and I'm super interested in getting into farming and learning more about the intersection of farming and social justice. I guess I can answer that. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm currently uh, sorting through and we're taking like work share volunteers still, um, which is an opportunity to basically commit to a weekly, um, basically like tr work trade. So you come for a, either a four or some people like to stay for longer, um, about a four hour shift um, working doing some form of labor on the farm. Um, also, we have folks who do work shares driving our shares to the locations where people pick them up um, in exchange for receiving a CSA share for the season. Um, so that's one way. And actually, we, <laughs> I think our communications person is still on here. Um, and I just linked a, uh, you can fill out the Google form that I linked in the chat um, if you want to get on our email lists. Um, and we are, slowly sorting out how to um, have like set volunteer days um, as well as just in general to like take more individual volunteers. Um, occasionally we make exceptions um, for, you know, we'll do, uh, we'll do volunteers um, sort of sporadically like for a two time or something like that experience. But um, right now we definitely are being cautious of our capacity in consistently having new volunteers. And so really the work share program is the best. You don't have to have tons of experience to be a work share. You just really have to be committed um, and willing to show up and work hard. Um, that's really the most important requirements for being a work share, being reliable. Um, and we totally are always looking for awesome people to fill those positions. And, and even if not right away, um, we often end up with turnover, you know, like when folks have to go back to school or if we have teachers. Um, around the fall and fall is also a really good time if you're new to farming to not have to um, sweat so hard necessarily and be out in the heat and um, do some of the really, really intensive physical labor. There's definitely always really intense physical labor, but um, work sharing is definitely the easiest way to volunteer with us right now. Um, but we'll definitely be working to have more open volunteer days. Hopefully this season we'll trial some, but um, looking forward, that's definitely on the, on the docket. Nice. Um, thank you. I don't want to keep everybody too much longer because I know it's already 630, but I just wanted to say um, if you want to buy Movement Ground eggs, you can go to cartwheelri.org, which is pretty cool. Um, and there's some instructions there. Um, and um, you can also support one of their CSA shares. Um, do you still have shares available or are they all sold out at this point? I think just in Providence. Is that right, Cohen? Yeah, we have about 10 shares available left in the Providence pickup spot, or we potentially could shift some of that to the Tiverton pickup spot. Um, but yeah, really just about 10 more. And the 30 left is for our solidarity show, share program. So we're almost sold out. Awesome. I'm super happy to hear that. And everybody should get on it. Um, and then if you want more updates, you want to learn more about Movement Ground, you can go to um, their website, movementgroundfarm.wordpress.com, follow them on social media. Um, <laughs> and um, if you're interested at all in what's going on with Hope's Harvest this season, um, we are leading up to our spring um, orientation that's going to be sometime mid-May, end of June. So that's one other potential way to get out on Movement Ground Farm is volunteering with Folks Harvest because we're going to have some work days out there this season, um, harvesting stuff for contracts for food pantries. Um, we're doing a spring training yoga series um, to get us limber for, I know I can't lift 40 pounds right now. So <laughs> um, we've got some free yoga classes that have been donated by local yoga studios. If you want to take advantage of that, we've got one tomorrow morning um, and every Saturday for April and May. Farmers welcome as well, if you all want to join. Um, and we are doing a cooking class, a cooking demonstration with um, Loren from the Tomaquag Museum of Succotash which is a native dish that uses crops um, that are native to the land. And she's gonna tell the history of that and the stories around that and stuff like that. So we're super, super excited for that um, coming up mid-May. Um, we'd love to have friends join us for that as well. Um, 
yeah, that's what I've got. Um, thank you so much. This was delightful. It was so amazing to hear like your journey. What an honor to like have you share that with us. And I just want um, to kind of frame it out at the very end. So when you show up with Hope's Harvest, you're participating, right? We're we're friends and neighbors with Movement Ground Farm. You're friends and neighbors with Hope's Harvest. Then you become friends and neighbors with Movement Ground Farm. Then we all become friends and neighbors. And then we're all like working together to build this amazing system that is grounded in the earth, but also in relationship and also in caring and nurturing each other and making sure we all have what we need. So that's really what this is all about. And um, we're so grateful for your partnership and we're so grateful to be able to continue to work with you um, to make sure that our community gets taken care of. So thank you. Thank you as well, Eva and Hope's Harvest and the whole crew. Bye. Have a great night. Take care, everyone.